the more wider your lens, the more you actually accomplish and achieve. If I, when you feel stuck and you don't know what to do, go do something for somebody else. You will unstuck what you have to do for you. You, we don't realize we're just constantly forcing and pushing without really what is the spring fountain from where this energy comes. If it's muddy in here, you create muddy thoughts, lack of clarity, tamas. Satyam Param Dimahi 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 <clears throat> Jai Gurudev. So we are discussing Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, and the last time we completed verse 64. And at this moment, the series of verses are discussing what is the quality how does one who is stable in wisdom, how does he interact with the world? How does he walk? How does he speak? What does he do when there's craving and aversion? Remember what we discussed. It's not that all those things disappear. It's how do they differ from us? And stable in wisdom, what are we referring to? We know we have wisdom, right? We have a lot of understanding. We've heard a lot. But it's there for a moment and then it disappears. Isn't it? We cannot sustain it. We are not established in wisdom. The word enlightenment is not used neither by Arjuna nor, nor by Lord Krishna. It's stable in mind, stable in wisdom. Those are the words that are used, right? So that's what we've been discussing. And it's not just a description. This is important to remember. The last two sessions that we've had make it very clear. It's not just, oh, that's how they are. A description like you're writing in a novel. They become tools and techniques, how to and what for us to do to get there. And one of the big things we talk about is controlling the senses, right? Controlling the senses and controlling the mind. Clear? I don't know how many of you have heard the previous sessions, but you're all clear, right? Because most of you I've seen uh, in the, all the prior sessions before. So remember, mind dwells on the same idea or the one of the senses dwells on the object of that sense. What happens? It becomes a desire. I want it. I like it. And then you dwell in it some more. Then you start to chase after it. How do I make it happen? And fulfilled desire leads to what? More desires. Unfulfilled desires lead to what? Frustration, anger. And it goes down, delusion, confusion of memory, and reason is lost, stability in mind is lost, and then it leads you to ruin. Ruin of what? All the wisdom disappears. Suddenly, our autopilot mind rules the game. Conditioning, limbic brain, autopilot. We are now out of control. That is what happens. In wisdom, who is in charge? We are. We have something to say about it. The 
pillars. Remember this, the four pillars and the six wealth that get discussed over and over. Those things become part of our practice if we use the wisdom. Those things enhance. Clear? So we'll start with verse 65. And again, those last two, three sessions are worth repeating, meaning go back and watch them again if you have the time, because it really brings a lot of attention to how our own mind functions, how you can just be walking along or sitting and suddenly the mind catches, oh, yoga for a blissful life, yellow shirt. And then the mind, what happens? The eyes get caught and then it starts to take off from there. Oh, why that shirt? Could be something else. Oh, it's very big letters. Oh, it could be smaller letters. Oh, it's very pretty. The more you dwell either the senses or the mind on any of the object, desire grows. And it's so easy. It's like you just, you get distracted into listening. You hear somebody say something. You, they, you don't even know the person. Have you noticed? They, maybe there's a group at an airport. Somebody's talking about something. You don't even know them. Naturally, the ear goes and starts to listen. Does it not? And the ear goes and it doesn't deflect away. And the mind doesn't say, none of my business. Not my monkey. Not my circus. Let me be focused here. Does it do that? No. It goes, and then it starts to engage in a conversation. And then all the files that are associated to anything similar to that discussion start popping up in our mind. It's like your um, server, like Google. You go to put in, like hardly you've typed four letters of a word, and history is anticipated because it knows what you're looking for, and all these ideas spring up doesn't it? It's exactly the same way. Mind hears something, ears hear something, you go. Somebody's just talking about, oh, brownies with ice cream and this particular kind of ice cream. That's it. it you, you're, you have blood sugar, <laughs> but you go. Mind starts to run after it. Desire goes, it gets bigger and bigger. And what happens if we don't control it, that tiny groove, vrutti it's called, right? We've, we, we remember this, that tiny crack in the space of consciousness. The more you indulge, the more you go in that direction, the bigger it gets. And we know that some desires are like the Grand Canyon. Are you with me? They're not just little cracks. And you have to remember, if there's a crack in this wall and somebody pours water on it, where will the water go? In the crack. Naturally, the water will flow in the crack. Consider the water as consciousness. Force of life itself, not just your attention, consciousness. Are you with me? If Consciousness is being poured on a blank slate. Are you with me? The wall? And there's a groove, that force of power, intelligence, energy, what we call satta, chitta, ananda. Where will it attach itself? Where will it pour down? That crack. Yes? A tiny desire starts to grow bigger, bigger, bigger. And all your prana, all our life force, starts to keep pouring down that same crack. Are you with me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. And this crack, you know, right? It can erode an entire mountain, can it not? That's how that crack gets bigger, 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 bigger. Then you need that much more prayerfulness, that much more gratitude, that much more practices, that many more advanced courses, that many more sahaj practice, that much more self-reflection, because to fill that crack, you need cement. Awareness. That is what fills the crack. The moment you see there's a crack there, Oh, the mind is running. 
I want it. I don't want it. This should be. This is right. This is wrong. They have it. Why don't I have it? The moment the mind, I like them. They shouldn't do this. My boss does. You go to sleep with a crowd of people thinking about them, going through what's going on, why they should be or should not. You just get rid of them. But no, they're in your life all the way, everywhere you move through the house. Yes? You go to sleep with a phone call and you wake up with the same person's phone call. You're like, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> you know, what happened? You have to have lightness towards it. Then you have some distance. You're watching the crack, not rolling down. You, the awareness, the consciousness is not going down that crack. So awareness, keeping some distance, not letting it get caught up, then it's like putting cement in that crack, you fill it up, you no longer know where the crack is. Consciousness runs down without awareness, creates a big gap. With awareness, it becomes like, like malam, like a bomb. You know, it soothes the grooves and the crevices and the scarring and the trauma and the ruti, the habits, the impressions, the likes, the dislikes, the should be, the should not be, the frustration, the agitation. And when the crack, when the bomb is there, then you are stable, established. Then you might still get lost, but only like a line in water and you're back. Like we did as kids, oh, what the hell, what is the pee? Oh, back. You can come back very quickly. Then you are slowly, slowly establishing in wisdom. Clear? This is what we're discussing. Okay, a quick synopsis. And Mala, please, 65. Prasade sarva dukkhanam anirasyopajayate Prasanna cheta suhyashu buddhif paryavatishtate. With the attainment of such placidity of minds, all his sorrows come to an end, and the intellect of such a person of tranquil minds, soon with withdrawing itself from all sides, becomes firmly established in God. So just to read you the English, the one before that as a reminder. <clears throat> the self-controlled sadhak, while enjoying various sense objects through his senses, which are disciplined and free from likes and dislikes, attains placidity of mind. Remember that? Free from likes and dislikes. It doesn't mean you will not have them. It means it will not live in your mind. Your sense of self is not tied into it. The frustration, the agitation doesn't come if you have it or you don't have it. All your force, your power, your energy, your effort is not pushing something away or pulling at something. You do what you have to do, but centered, placidity of mind, equanimous, in balance not out of balance. You see, you know, um, a lot of times I just flew the examples are there. I ordered this thing and it's not there. And there's a big, like, what is she supposed to do? She can't jump off a plane. Even if she could, she can't hop back on the flight. She might be able to jump off. That's possible. But she's not going to be able to hop back on the flight with your food that you ordered. But that goes on. And then you arrive and you're walking and just moving through baggage claim and they're going towards the other direction. And you still hear them talking about, I can't believe it. Three and a half hours later, I didn't get to eat. Okay. There's a lot on you, I'm sure. It's going to be okay. <laughs> you understand. It's... The, especially, you know, right now, they say if you fast a little, it's good for you. This is all over the place. India knew it all along, but now everybody knows it. So, no. Today is Passive a mind. It means what? Balance, economist, right? Then comes what uh, we just read. With the attainment of such placidity of mind, tranquility, economist, balanced mind, all his sorrows come to an end, and the intellect of such a person of tranquil mind, soon withdrawing itself from all sides, becomes firmly established in God. If you get balanced from craving and aversion, you become equanimous, then you come into acceptance. 
you know that point, accept things, people, places, situations as they are, then the mind comes into acceptance. Then what happens? Then the senses naturally withdraw. Where is the mind in acceptance? Present moment, right here, right now. When it's caught up in craving and aversion, I want it, I don't like it, where is the mind? Past or future? This was like this. Why isn't it like that? I didn't have it then. Oh my God, if what I thought, if I started a business then, it didn't work. Should I move back to India? No, I shouldn't move back. I know my, it just, it's endless. It keeps going. Are you with me? That's what this, this is saying. When the mind is in acceptance, when the mind is in the present moment, the intellect of such a person is a tranquil mind. Look, it's not get rid of the intellect. That's the other thing we do. We come on the path and we have this idea, oh, I got it, you know, I, that's the intellect. No, no, centered, calm intellect is what does it do? It reflects the intelligence of consciousness more clearly. Did you hear? It's not intellect is craving an aversion, should be, should not be. But when should be, should not be is equanimous, when you are in acceptance of situation as is, then what happens? The intelligence, consciousness reflects itself more centered, more clearly with its qualities. Are you clear? Yes? It's very beautiful. <clears throat> Tranquil mind, soon withdrawing itself from all sides, becomes firmly established in God. This is the other thing. We have this idea of God as like something that's outside of living life. It reflects, divinity gets reflected, calm, centeredness, tranquility, joyfulness, care, love, all those qualities come through. That means established in God. Do you understand? It doesn't mean everything else disappears. This verse we discussed, I don't remember the verse anymore, but that was two sessions back, where because you're enlightened or established in wisdom, doesn't mean these things go away, you're just not disturbed by them. Do you recall that? You guys recall that? Okay, next verse. Nasti buddhir ayuktasya, nacha yuktasya bhavana, nacha bhavayata shanti, ashantasya kutasukham. He who has not controlled his mind and senses can have no determinate intellect nor contemplation. Without contemplation, he can have no peace. And how can there be happiness for one lacking peace of mind? I think that was self-explanatory. Did your belly go into a little knot? Yes? Look, he who has not controlled his mind and senses can have no determinate intellect. Have you seen people, I don't know what to do, I'm not sure, they talk to a thousand people, they cannot make a choice. Have you seen this, yes or no? Yes? yes? I don't know what to do. They will go talk to the wisest person, including the guru, research everything, friends and family, you know, I, I don't know, go pay a coach for it, and then I'm not sure. Yes or no? The mind is not clear, focused, determined not forced, then what ends up happening, what that person ends up doing is they push their way through. Force. Tamas and rajas and force are used to get to a choice. That's very different from, I'm crystal clear, if I have to get up right now and go out of this room, I don't go through, oh my God, there's an air vent, there's a window, there's a back window, there's a door, there's a side window, what should I do? I, you know, I need to, it's determined mind, choice is clear, you get up, you go. The moment you don't know what you have to do, what you want to do, it's not called choice anymore, it's called confusion. 
When is it confused? When the mind is all over the place. I want a little of that and a little of that and a little of that. And if you remember, go back to the verse. When a desire is fulfilled, there is greed. When a desire is unfulfilled, there is anger. The moment you have a fulfilled desire, I want more. I want something else. I want a different experience. This is such a thing for us to really honestly, openly, directly have a conversation with ourselves about what exactly happens. Fulfilled desire, does the game come to an end there? No. Do you say, I got it, now I'm happy? I want a Tesla, I want a Tesla. So you have a Tesla. <coughs> then, because you wanted a Tesla, you got the first model. I don't know anything about cars, but well, that's what came in my head as an example. Then you want that second one. Does it stop there? No. Then you want the self-driving one. I, I want that one. <laughs> because I don't drive. <laughs> Isn't it? That's what happens. Fulfilled desire creates greed. That's why you see people with so much abundance of things in their life, wealth and name and fame and fortune. And don't you, and haven't you wondered, like, when is enough going to be enough? Have you wondered about that for people? Enough will never come. The moment it's fulfilled, there's a more, there's a new game, there's a bigger game. And greed ultimately leads to enormous amount of power and control and sense of ego. You're far away from stable and use of wisdom and knowledge and stability of mind and so on. And an unfulfilled desire, once again, is the road to ruin, anger, Memory, confusion, delusion, and loss of reason, and ruin. But this, this verse, he has no control over his mind. He does not have a determined intellect, nor contemplation. That's when you end up saying to people, oh my God, don't you guys see? What are you, stupid? This, this, when this comes out, because... They're not present. They don't contemplate. They don't see. How could you not see that's going to happen? I give you the most ridiculous example. There was a devotee. She is a devotee. I haven't seen her for a long time, but um, a Norwegian lady. She had come to the Bangalore ashram many years ago. Super devoted. She had one desire. She wanted a child. I want a child, I want a child. She would pray every time she saw Gurudev, she saw Gurudev's kutir, and she would go in front of the kutir when she couldn't, and pray to God, to, I want a child, you know? Eventually, she left India, she went back to Norway, and when I saw her, she had a child. And it was, maybe the child was six months old, I forgot his name, but perhaps six months old, and I said, Oh my God, you must be so happy now. You have a child. And she said, I don't know. It's so much work. I never get any sleep. I have to get up all the time. I was a little bit perplexed. And, you know, constantly, I have to constantly give attention and time and feed the baby, put the baby to sleep, wash the baby all the time. So, I was not being facetious or difficult. I just, it popped up like, what the hell were you thinking a child would mean? Like, what, what were you thinking? It's like you buy an elephant and then you say he doesn't fit in my house. Eh, how did you think he was going to walk through your door? He broke my door down. Well, hello? It's an elephant. And I don't know. I wasn't thinking. Contemplation, self-referral, what is best, big picture wide angle is lost. Has this not been your experience? When you get lost, when you, I want this, I want that, maybe that's better, maybe that's better. Don't you notice you cannot make a single choice and whatever you choose, are you happy with? The mind says, maybe I should have done the other thing. Doesn't it? Yes or no? Such an amazing sutra, no? Without contemplation, he can have no peace. Then you lose sleep, and you lose health, and you lose relationships, and you make all kinds of crazy judgments. 
And how can there be happiness for one lacking peace of mind? It's a question mark, but it's a rhetorical question. Like, how the hell do you expect to be happy when you can't sleep, when you can't eat, when you can't think, when you can't make decisions, when you can't put any effort behind it, and all you're doing is wallowing in, oh, I should have, would have, could have, because fulfilled desires also increase your grasp. Do you understand what I mean by that? Holding on, I cannot lose this. It's not enough. You get, desire gets fulfilled, you want more. But does the hand that's holding what it got loosen? No, it holds this and it, so the fist gets tighter, the grasp increases. Think about the challenge of that, you know, just physically, you have something in your hand and you don't want to lose it, so you'll hold it tighter and tighter, you know? I was, I, it's funny, it's a different thing, but I was, my bag was a little more full than I expected. I dragged a computer with me. I was thinking it's the computer without the charger. Or <laughs> I was trying to lighten my load and someone gave me the idea, don't bring the charger. What? what? <laughs> That'll save you space. <laughs> so, anyway. So I was dragging, and you know, when you come out of the airplane, you have to go up the, the ramp, so you cannot just have it on the side and go. You have to drag. And I was noticing how tight the grip was, and in that moment, my mind had this, this thought like, oh my God, are you holding on to this because it's important, or is it because if you let go and it goes down, there are people behind you and it's going to, you know, injure them? It's just to, to be aware of, remember that exercise. You must continuously reflect back senses. You're touching something. You can feel the tightness of the grip on your wheeler, on your bag. And you see it's getting tighter. It's just because it was getting heavier. And I really, I had this thought, how much stuff do we drag around from place to place? What if I just had two pairs of clothes and I washed it at night and wore it in the morning and washed it at night and wore it in the morning? It would be so much easier. I could have just like carried myself out like that, you know? And then I compensated by saying, okay, I'm building a bicep. Honestly, I went through this whole thing. The mind is crazy. The only thing is you have to look at it and find humor in it, you know? It's it like, oh, bicep, okay, how do I do a tricep now? <laughs> Continue. Indriyanam hi charatam yen manonu vidhiyate tadasya harati pragnyam vayurnavam evam bhasi as the wind carries away a boat upon the waters, even so of the senses moving among sense objects, the one to which the mind is attached takes away his discrimination. He's, he's sort of recapturing what we've been discussing very beautifully. As the wind carries away a boat upon the waters, even so of the senses moving among sense objects, the one to which the mind is attached takes away his discrimination. One of the pillars is lost, vivek, discernment, right? That is the thing that gets lost when we grasp on, latch on, when one of our senses and the mind latch on to a desire, an object of that sense. It's very clear. What do we lose? Discernment, the big picture. What is lasting, what is not. Now, listen, we apply this to living daily life, but remember, eventually Bhagavad Gita is taking Arjuna where? The Lord is taking Arjuna where? To the highest self, right? That doesn't mean we can not apply this to life because I keep repeatedly saying, Life is the battlefield. Arjuna is actually in an extreme, quote, battlefield, dealing with his own people. That's what life is. We're fighting our own people. For a moment, they're ours, and then at a certain moment, they're strangers. Then some strangers become ours, and then they become bigger strangers. Yes or no? And we're 
continuously battling two things, me and mine. Remember, go back always to the lessons learned. Don't just forget that and just latch on to this. If you do that, it becomes conceptual. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? If you listen to this only a verse or one session at a time and you don't bring in the prior knowledge and the lessons, then you only develop concepts. Then what happens is the intellect, buddhi feels temporarily elevated. It steps out of right and wrong, like it, dislike, craving and aversion. For a moment it goes, oh wow, yes, oh. Oh, that makes sense. Equilibrium, mind settles down. That craving and aversion, attachment goes more towards neutrality. But then it's just an idea. It becomes a concept. So you have to take it back with you. Me and mine is the battlefield of life. You protect what's mine, whether it's things or people or objects or ideas or opinions thoughts, correct? And you protect what you consider mine. People, places, things, objects, that's it. And it's from this that desire starts to come. I and they, they're mine, we should have more. The moment you have me and mine, what do you have? Other. Now you have an enemy. Now you have comparison. Now you have competition. I belong to you. Remember I told you the very first verse in the Gita practically when Lord Krishna speaks, all the knowledge is given, just like all the courses. If you let go of me and mine, you have no more other. What do you have? Belonging. Yes? Okay, go. Tasmad yasya mahabaho Nigrihitani sarvashaha Indriyar nindriyar kibyaha Tasya pragnya pratishtita. Therefore, Arjuna, he whose senses are completely restrained from their objects is said to have a stable mind. Yanisha sarva bhutanam. Tasyam jagrati samyami, yasyam jagrati bhutani, sanisha pashyato munehe. That which is night to all beings, in that state of divine knowledge and supreme bliss, the God realized yogi keeps awake, and that the ever changing transient worldly happiness in which all beings keep awake is night to the seer. I have to read this again. Hold on. <laughs> that which is night to all beings, in that state of divine knowledge and supreme bliss, the God-realized yogi keeps awake. Yognidra. Conscious, aware, alert. No? Once you are stable in mind as described in the previous verse, then what is there? Witnessing. That word is not used, but that's what that's being described here, right? That which is night to all beings, in that state of divine knowledge and supreme bliss, the God-realized yogi keeps awake. And that in which all beings keep awake is night to the seer. Honestly, I have to read this a little bit more carefully and perhaps even look it up, maybe try and see what the commentary is, because I don't know that I know the full depth of what's being said here. I'm sure it's much more than this simple sentence or two that I said. So let's leave this for now and I'll circle back next week. Okay, I will um, pull out Guruji's book and read and see if this verse is addressed. Yeah, go. Apuryamana machalam pratishtam samudramapa pravishanti edvat tadvat kama yam pravishanti sarve sashanti mapnoti na kama kami. 
as the waters of different rivers enter the ocean which though full on all sides remains undisturbed likewise he in whom all enjoyments merge themselves without causing disturbance attains peace not he who hankers after such enjoyments beautiful as the waters of different rivers enter the ocean which through full on all sides which though full on all sides remains undisturbed likewise he in whom all enjoyments merge themselves without causing disturbance attain peace not he who hankers after such enjoyments again this you know we've we've talked about this in in many many different ways remember they're not stuck with the joy the aversion the resistance in the head okay just like a child like a line in water it's there great it's not there great there's no ripple created there's no resistance no push no pull created for one who is established in being established in wisdom yeah as the waters of different rivers enter the ocean which though full on all sides remains undisturbed it's such an amazing amazing example you know have you seen with such force and with such the water gushes toward the ocean no gushes towards the ocean when it gets there the ocean isn't freaked yes there's this sort of the backwaters you know the, the ocean comes the river's going and you get this sort of beauty to it but the ocean is not like now it's overflowing and it doesn't know what to do however many rivers however much rain pours down the rivers keep flowing into the ocean and the ocean looks the same it's it's never overflowing it's never oh there's there's no room here that is it's a state it's really hard for us to understand but you know we've talked about many of the examples do you remember the wcf it was sunday we finished wcf immediately from there we went to the wisdom series you would think that we just left Guruji's meeting room and we had a little satsang in the meeting room yes or no yes. we're like huh and then what and wisdom there was nothing from his side there was not a bleep of did you see what we just did so much we accomplished and they did that and we did that that would be the ocean getting full and overflowing nothing nothing like that is there it doesn't matter what is achieved what is not achieved what we on the other hand rise up and crash rise up and crash right go beautiful vihaya kamanya sarvan umam charati nispraha nirmamo nirahankara sa shanti madhi gachati he who has given up all desires and moves free from attachment egoism and thirst for enjoyment attains peace this would then make us say oh now we have to give up all desires yes yes no he who has given up all desires and moves free from attachment desires remember that verse desires continuously come and go even if it's to say it's time to eat i want to eat that's what a desire but if food is not there hi toba hi toba oh my god you know get off go to baggage claim no food came three and a half hours oh my god how could they do that do you understand this it's not that there is no attachment it's not about i have to get rid of desires what are the three qualifications attachment and ego i didn't get food she's not disturbed that the person next to her didn't get food why isn't that person disturbed the person next to them didn't get food why not 
It's not me and it's not mine. If they were my children or my husband or my brother, I would be disturbed for them. Am I really disturbed for them? No, somehow I lose something. It's, remember the first two, three talks. What is mine makes me feel self-importance. What is me makes me feel important, and what I consider mine makes me feel important. I get ego gratification out of it. My children are doctors. My children are not behaving well. If your sister's children are not behaving well and they are exactly not this, you know, if you don't feel very close to your sister, you're not so disturbed. But if you're very close to your sister and then, they, then you feel a little shy, you know, about those children showing up in your house around your good friends that you have to impress through yourself and your kids and your sister's kids. My whole family is very educated and smart and important. Yes or no? Do you understand this? It's not attachment and ego, me or mine. It's not that you have to get rid of desires. Look at it. And honestly, if you break it down, remember in early on somebody shared that she was disturbed about her husband coming late or some such thing, and then she reminded herself, you know, ah, I'm not really disturbed about the thing he did or did not do. I'm disturbed because he's my husband who did or didn't. Right? Arjun is not saying, I am against violence. I'm against killing. I'm against having a kingdom. I'm against taking, you know, vengeance. That's, he's not saying any of those things. He's against killing his own people for those things. If he has to kill other people, no problem. Give it to me. Do you see that? So it's not about, Lord Krishna didn't say, hey, let go of the desire to have that. None of those things. He's moved him from selfish gain to ethics to higher knowledge. That's all that we're seeing. And we are on a journey moving from me and mine to you and to us and ours. Right? And it's not that you lose. The more wider your lens, the more you actually accomplish and achieve. If I ask you, if I ask anybody, who do you admire? What kind of people? What kind of leaders? What kind of teachers? What kind of parents? What kind of people? You will see the one... ...favoritism, that teacher you want for your kids, yes or no? The leader who looks at the big picture, not just my profits, my company, for me and my kids and my sharehold. He, he knows how to share in the profits with his staff and the people who make it happen. The one who says we when the success comes and who says I when there is failure. This is a very different ballgame. So we're not saying get rid of desires. It's saying expand your vision, not just for the highest, but to play the game out there in the world also. You know, to be happier as people, as individuals, as family, as community, and, you know, bigger global sense, of course. Look, attachment we discussed, ego we discussed, and thirst for enjoyment attains peace. You also have to let go of thirst. I want it, I want it grasping. If I don't have it, what will happen? When am I going to get it? I don't know. Sleeplessness comes, feverishness comes. You can't eat, you can't sleep. What you eat, you cannot digest. Somehow you don't enjoy the family, you don't enjoy the moment. This is a sign of thrust, grasping. Desire is what originates. And then all your effort to make it happen because you think you're going to achieve peace when you fulfill it. That has grasping. You've lost sight of the fact that when a desire is fulfilled, it'll give you comfort, but it's not going to change you or who you are or your sense of self even for more than a moment. Is that clear? The question is good. How is thirst, I'll use that word, grasping different from desire? 
a desire arises, then all your effort, all your energy, the constant wheeling of what if becomes a thirst. People start salivating before they even have it. What happens? You have a desire, you're going to open your company. Have you noticed it succeeds a little bit and people spend the money they haven't yet received? Yes or no? This is grasping. This is salivating. This is thirst. I'm going to get it. I know I'll get it. It's going to happen. Okay, let's just, you know, you got to spend big to have big. They start then doing this kind of thing. Yes or no? This is thirst. This is grasping. You know, you've lost sight of discrimination, Vivek. You no longer can discern the big picture. Yes? Go. Isha Brahmi Stiti Partha Nainam Prapya Vimukyati Stitvas Yamanta Kalipi Brahma Nirvana Mrichati Arjuna, such is the state of the God realized soul. Having reached this state, he overcomes delusion and established in the state, even at the last moment, he attains Brahmic bliss. Oh Arjuna, such is the state of the God-realized soul. Having reached this state, he overcomes delusion. What is it that we are referring to? What, how has Lord Krishna defined delusion? What? You remember? Everybody go back and watch all those pre... <laughs> delusion what? I am this body. I am my thoughts and my mind and my likes and my dislikes. What is the delusion? Arjuna is walked through what? They don't even have a body. They are not their body. You are not this body. They have never died. They have never been born. You have never died. They have never... What are you worried about them dying and killing? Don't worry about it. Pick up. Go for it, dude. That's the delusion. The attachment to I am this body and then doing all that we have to to meet the needs of the body and the needs of the body is a little stomach and a roof over the head. But the needs of the mind which thinks it's in the body and the sense of separation that comes from that. Because if I am this body, if I'm localized between head to toe, five feet, six inches tall, and I wake up out of bed, how many things do I have to navigate as this five foot, six foot per, five feet, six inch person? A lot. Look, just in front of me, there's 30 people I have to navigate. All five feet something, and a couple of them are taller. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? I will operate out of fear, worry, anxiety. And it's not just people, number of objects, number of things, number of vehicles. I'm continuously overwhelmed when I see myself as a tiny, limited self. Do you understand this? As children, why are we fearless? Why? They don't see themselves as head to toe. They are not tied to the body yet. It slowly develops that I am this body. That's why they run fearlessly. They move towards something. It's mom and dad who are, no, 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 no. We instill the limitation. They see themselves fully free-spirited. They behave that way also. Isn't it? Free, vibrant, spirited. That's how they live. No? The more we operate from the delusion of limited identity, limited self, body, the more we feel separate from everything. And the more separate we feel, the more we have to preserve ourselves, protect ourselves, the more we will be afraid. Fear gets bigger. You don't feel empowered. You don't feel confident. You don't feel, it's okay, I'm going to go for it. Then you have to think and you paralyze yourself with what if, what if not, how, how not, when, when should I not, who, they do, they don't, 
It's continuous. Then we do things in life, we even succeed in life. But then we wonder, how come is it that my success is incremental and other people boom at it? The difference between that person and, and oneself is what? That sense of self-empowered. It's bigger than me, 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 my limited thing. I got to preserve, protect. It's not that somebody else is so much more brilliant, so much more smarter, and our intelligence is just that much. Look, when you first left, uh, you know, everybody here is from India. When you first left India, you had a different kind of juice in the system. Yes or no? And you took different kind of chances and different kind of risk because you had nothing to lose. Correct? You had nothing to lose. Not even the ego, because at that time the ego was boosted. I went to America. I'm studying in America. My son has gone to America. Yes or no? You operated very differently. You had nothing to lose. But now, remember, it's short-lived. It's not enough that you're in America. Now you have to do something else in America. It's not enough that you got your education in America. It's not enough that you got, oh, my son, my daughter, they have a job in Google. They work for Amazon. The poor guy is pulling his hair out. <laughs> yes? Have you gone? I've gone to the, you know, those Amazon and Google and uh, Facebook at the time. It's meta now, but to give talks and you walk through these corridors. Everything is there, basically sugar and caffeine to make sure you never leave. You know, your brain is buzzing and photos, photos. Look, mom, I have, yeah, they're drugging you so that you can stay there pulling your hair out. Do you understand this? Because you have so much more to prove. Remember that grasping, what I'm telling you, you hold on tightly to what you've achieved because the ego attachment boosting doesn't happen unless there's more to hold. It's not enough to let this go and move towards more. That's not it. If you leave your job for another job, you want at least as much as you had there and then some. Otherwise, oh, why you have another job? Oh, uh, well, well, yes, this is really, it's, this is not impractical. This is not woo, 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 this is for those, no. Just think about how much the mind is caught up in all of this. Such is the state of the God-realized soul. Having reached this state, he overcomes delusion sense of belonging, sense of self, goes out of the limited identity to something bigger. Hmm? And established in this state, even at the last moment, he attains Brahmic bliss. That means you got to stay at the game 100%. Even at the last moment. And then don't wait, okay, let me just do me and mine now and let me hold on and let me, you know, go out. No, because at the last minute you're not going to remember any of this. At the last moment of death, what will you remember? All the difficulties, the miseries. You know? Like you've seen somebody who's not well, they're ill, what do they remember? All the joyful things? If they have no awareness, no wisdom, they remember, ouch, 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 ouch. And they did this, and I should have, and I could have, and didn't, and so on. Unless you're aware, you know? <clears throat> Can you sing that last verse? Yes. Om Tat Sadhiti Shreemad Bhagavad Gita Su Upanishad Su Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastri Shri Krishna Arjuna Sambhade Sankhya Yogo Nama Dviti Yodhyaya Thus is in the Upanishad sung by the Lord, the science of Brahma, 
the scripture of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna ends the second chapter entitled Sankhya Yoga, the Yoga of Knowledge. Thus, in the Upanishad, sung by the Lord himself. I mean, you know, look, you have to, you can't, you have to remember, like the mind has to remain in the bigness of what we're talking about. You've heard no Guruji say a thousand times, so many births, so many, 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 many lives are possible. And to have a human birth is a huge blessing from the divine force. Yes? And then to have a human birth and not just be interested in eat, sleep, sex, procreate, reaccumulate, and do it again. Not just that. I'm not saying we're out of that, but not just that. Eat, sleep, and accumulate. If you have that, which we do since we're all here, then that's even more grace, more blessing from the divine. But then, not only are you interested in something more, you actually have the wisdom, the knowledge, the techniques. You actually meditate, you look inward, you self-reflect. That could come from a book, that could come from anywhere, but there you are, that you have. That's already even more rare, even bigger blessing. And then to have a guru. See, lots of people might have met Gurudev, but we're in a different boat, yes? In terms of having a guru, yes or no? Very different boat. So, and then to have a guru. Then to have a guru, like what we have, that is even more rare, even more blessings and grace and gift. I, I don't have the words for it, even more. That we have a guru and that you are connected in that way. And that this knowledge, the highest of knowledge, comes with a guru embodied principle through us, through all of us together, charged in that way, is even more rare. And then to receive this knowledge, Sankhya Yoga, the highest of knowledge, is even more rare. It is. It's an enormous thing, you know, it's, it's not even a 0.02% of the planet. We prioritize everything. We give so much importance to everything. We're so like aware, I have these, I have that, I have that. And you compare, when you compare yourself to other people, you're so proud of whatever it is that you have. You can't forget this. Look around in life, if you must compare, compare to this. Look around at this, you know. In the, Upanishad, in the Upanishad, sung by the Lord, the science of Brahma, the scriptures of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjun. That's you and that's me. They are Nimit, he's Nimit, but we are Arjun. ends the second chapter entitled Sankhya Yoga, the Yoga of Knowledge. Chapter 2, complete. <laughs> Jai Gurudev. Jai Gurudev. So beautiful, no? <clears throat> it's actually great timing. I have like 10 minutes for question and answers. Comments, questions, anybody? from in person or online. Uh, Vera, yes, go. My faithful sweetheart, go. I, I give you uh, two weeks off from my questions. 
So the knowledge is imparted from chapter two onwards. Okay. No, no, no. You One think day. that Lord Krishna is standing there for his health <laughs> over there for a whole chapter. It's a lot of verses. Every verse is really, really important. If you don't see, if you only look for the knowledge part without interrelating yourself and Arjun, you will only conceptualize. It will not lead you anywhere. I mean, concepts, I suppose, of knowledge are better than concepts of other things. There's always a bright side to life. You can look at it like that, but you're not maximizing. You must put yourself again and again and again in whose shoes? Arjun's shoes, not Krishna's shoes. <laughs> if you keep looking at the knowledge, in whose shoes are you going all the time? Lord Krishna's shoes, they're too big. You know? So you must continuously go back into Arjun's shoes. You cannot ignore anything. No? Okay, any? Yes? If you, if you let go of um, some, of that, <clears throat> some of that attachment to desire, um, would that lead to maybe a little less pride or motivation in your life? Actually, the question is, if you let go of some of the attachment, he's very careful. Not all. <laughs> if you let go of some of the attachment, does that reduce the drive or the motivation? That was the other word. You know? Look. <clears throat> Letting go is a state of mind that we're talking about. Are you understanding what I'm, what I'm wanting to say? It's not don't have a desire to then act to go fulfill it. The more the desire is in your head, the less effective you will be in going for what you want. It's the other way around. It's this feverishness of holding on which leads to more fear. Attachment leads to what? Fear, anxiety worry. It doesn't give you ambition. You're propelled by fear, you're calling ambition. Propelled through joy and energy and enthusiasm is what we're calling letting go of the attachment and jumping into action fully. When you are fully in action, you're not thinking about your desire or your attachment. Have you noticed that? You, you really think about this. When you are fully engaged in action towards whatever it is, you don't notice time, you don't you know, notice like the resistance to things, energy keeps coming to you, you feel vibrant somehow more, like I can do anything a little bit more. It's when you're attached, you feel fatigue, mind gets exhausted, fear comes, worry comes. You don't go at the end of the day, Go to bed and say, I did the best I could. Oh my God, what if not? I should have, I could have. Those thoughts come more. That actually takes away your capacity, what you're calling ambition, I'm calling capacity, talent, will. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Attachment. <laughs> do, what's your experience? When you're attached, do you do more? Uh, I mean, I, I heard this idea when I was very small. No, but, but now you're doing whatever you're doing in life, right? And you're going for things in life, of course. Uh, looking at you, you look successful. I can't show you guys. <laughs> looking, you look like, you know, you're working, you have a home, job, whatever. When you're attached, what is your state of mind? That's the question. Yeah. I mean, honestly speaking, I feel like I give a little bit more when I think it's mine. And, and where is it coming from? Wait, attached means what? Let's define that. To you, what does it mean? It's mine. It's mine, okay. I agree, you'll give more. We already said that, right? That's, that's basics number one. When I think it's mine, I give more. And then what? Attachment leads to what? Me and mine is one thing, my desire. 
But now you get attached to the desire, the results of the desire is what starts to drive you. It's fear-based. You're not anymore coming from joy and enthusiasm. There's preserving, protecting. Do you understand what I'm saying? Did you hear the prior talks on me and mine? Yeah, you have to go back and hear those things. Is it clear to the rest of you, those of you who've been listening? Yes or no? Yes? Yeah. I see your thumbs up. <clears throat> How do you go for what you're doing in life? What state of mind? That is what we're talking about, attachment. Is the mind in fear, anxious, worry? If not, what will I do? If yes, then I go for it, I go for it. But what's your state of mind? You'll notice when you're happier, when you feel freedom, when there's more confidence, then you have a lot more juice and clarity of thought and your actions yield more result. When it's based on fear, you work uphill to some degree. More effort is needed. Results are not as expected. So then you go for it again. I have to do this. My kids, it's my thing. It's my job. It's my money. Yes, it is. That's been established. Now move. You don't have to attach to know it's mine. You know it's yours. Move. I'm not telling you go, go do this for other people. Right? That's not the statement here. Are you clear? You know when you do it for other people, when you feel stuck, that will help you to get freed. Did you hear that? When you feel stuck and you don't know what to do, go do something for somebody else. You will unstuck what you have to do for you. It's, this is mathematics, I tell you. Try it out. You know? Go clean their closet. It doesn't matter what. Get out of your me, 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 and something else will come towards you. No? Exactly on time. Anything else? It's good, no? We, we did two chapters. That's awesome. It's really great. I, I love the last statement you said, Didi. I never heard about it. Do something for others, then you will get unstuck about the things where you are stuck. Somebody in here, in, in the thing called the Gita, talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Selfless action and service, you know. Everything is energy, physics, basic physics. Everything is energy. Everything. To blink, you need energy. To think, you need energy. To change your thought from negative to positive, you need energy. To drop out of thought and into, in, into intuition, you need energy. You, we don't realize we're just constantly forcing and pushing without really what is the spring fountain from where this energy comes. If it's muddy in here, you create muddy thoughts, lack of clarity, tamas. You know, anxiety comes with that. So when you feel stuck, it's not that your body's not stuck. When you feel stuck, what's stuck? What part of you? Your head. You're stuck in some memory that's dragging you down, stuck in some intellect, some concept, some idea, some results that you had in the past, and you don't know how to get unstuck. So you keep thinking, you keep talking, you keep planning. Does that get you unstuck? No. Go and do something for somebody else, because it's all one energy. Something will shift. Some little gap happens in the mind for some new thing to drop in. And when you do do something for somebody else, the universe has your back. It gets behind you. That's when it says, oh, there's a little opening here. Let me pour through. If you have a Grand Canyon, doesn't matter how much you pour, it's gone. You know, however much it rains, you never see floods in the Grand Canyon. Trust me, gone. You know. <clears throat> Did 
Tammy, you're laughing. <laughs> What's the joke? Grand Canyon is the joke. <laughs> You'll never go to the Grand Canyon and see it the same way again. Although I have never been, I must say. Okay, anything else? Any question? Are you clear? Really? You should debate me. I like to be debated because it gets me clear. You have to remember, you know, this, is, this becomes our sadhana. Again and again and again, you have to re-go back to this. If not, it's very easy to not stay established in the wisdom that you have. A wise person knows it's better to be happy and do what you have to do than to be miserable and do what you have to do. Yes or no? Or how often do you do things because you're just happy versus stressed out and miserable and feeling pressured and all of that? No? Oh my God, everybody got serious. <laughs> They're gonna die one day. <coughs> and then you have achieved everything. And I don't know, how, how many often, how often do you open your phone? Oh my God, Steve Jobs, amazing. How often do you say that? How often? He's dead. <laughs> No matter how much you praise him and think, awesome dude, he's dead. What good is a legend when you're not around? Be a legend. Be legendary now. You know how you become legendary? You live. Freedom. Not bogged down. That's how you become legendary. Free. Vibrant. Happy. Joyful. And successful. I'm not telling you walk around with a begging bowl and a smile on your face, you know? That's not it. 200% full on. So you had to see the, in the airplane, at the airplane, hi, how are you? Oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You give a little compliment to someone. Then little something changes, you know. A sincere one, don't fake it. Oh, okay, fake it. Do something. Don't just sit there like the rest of them. Happy, easy, free. Let life force move. Then so much comes to you. All right? <clears throat> okay, so I think what we'll do is we will take a break for July. In the meantime, don't lose track of it all. Keep your mind engaged, you know, if you have the time. It's something you could be playing in the background. Maybe just forget the pre-recorded things, like what we've gone through, but just the Sanskrit stanzas you can find online and just listen to the first two chapters. That's something you could do also. And as you hear the Sanskrit, some of it, you'll, it'll remind you of something, you know, so... Stay engaged, okay? Okay, eyes closed, eyes closed. Let's take a lo long breath in. <clears throat> Let it go. <sighs> Sada Shiva Samarambha. Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asma Shri Guru Paryantam Vande Vande Guru Param Param
Jay Gurdiv. I don't know if you feel it there, but it's a lot of energy, no? In the room, like, isn't it? I mean, like I said, so fortunate. You have to remind yourself, you know, in a very conscious way. You walk the path with one who has reached the goal, established fully. It's insane. And I'll tell you one last thing, something that's obvious, I think about a lot, comes in my awareness a lot. Like it or not, conscious or unconscious, intended or not, every single person is headed to the same place. Life, through whatever it has to do, is continuously moving us towards this journey, meaning past things, situations, people, to oneself, moving from selfish gain to ethics, moving from selfish ethics to something greater, higher, to the higher self. This is an inevitable journey. All the ups and downs in life are there because in its own way, it is awakening the light within you. Can you not remember, there was a time when something happened, something difficult happened in life, you would blame the person or the situation or the thing outside. Yes? Completely. And that's before Art of Living I'm talking about, or maybe early, you blame anything was landing on somebody else. Then, slowly, light entered, right? The crack has... Now you say, oh, what is it about me? How come I did this? Then you started looking at yourself and blaming yourself. Yes or no? Not that that's fun, but that's evolution. Because then you have control over change. You can decide what to do better and how to do it better. Yes? But then the light continued. Events and things and situations and somehow. Then you say, how is it like this? Now you ask the question, not with self-blame or not blame for other people, but how is it like this? Oh, I need to complain about myself. It's a conscious light awareness of your own behavior or ideas, self-reflection. Yes or no? This is, this is an inevitable journey. It doesn't matter whether you have a guru path, no path. It's just that they're hard knocks. And they will keep coming till you learn. You, any human being, any one person. You know? And the fortunate, beyond fortunate, it's a gift. The blessed ones are those to whom this comes in this sequence that I have been describing. It's enormous. Enormous. And if nothing else, if you count your blessings for that, other things will also follow. Because in gratitude, you change your vibe. You know? This, this is physics. This is not metaphysics. Go, go research neuroscience. You see what you'll find. You know, there's a natural repulsion from some people and a natural attraction towards some other people. Oftentimes, it's a reflection of what's going on inside, and therefore, that's what sits in front of you. you know? So, don't get lost in the month. Okay, I'll remind you next week also. <laughs> Don't get lost. All right. Jagger did. Jagger did.